Yeah, that was, uh, that was more than I asked for. How is everyone doing? Look, I love this room. This room is like such a great setting. It's really intimate. It's like the right number of people. Everyone looks pretty happy to be here. Boston's cold. Uh, I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, so yeah, it was about 16 degrees, but it's a little bit more of a bitter cold. So, uh, you know, who, who am I? Uh, my name's Nate Walkingshaw. And this slide up here really represents a lot of the things that I've done in my career. Uh, if I told you that I would, thought I would be up on this stage talking to all of you, um, you know, I wouldn't believe it myself. And the reason why is I started out as an emergency medical technician, making $7.14 an hour. And uh, I invented a whole series of medical devices. I started in hardware uh, and then migrated from hardware into software, IoT and then really took my career into software development. And if you were really to like tie like where my heart really still lives, it still lives around patient care, around fire and EMS. And so, you know, we're gonna go through a whole series of, I think, emotions and events as I go through my presentation. It's all net new content. Uh, for those of you guys who haven't seen my presentations in the past, um, I'll reference a Mind the Product talk that I gave uh, in June called The Heartbeat of a Product. And my goal here, like, really is to serve you. The whole purpose of this talk is really to, to serve you as, as individuals and uh, have a great conversation today. So this slide here uh, is really how I think about product development. This is really what I think about product management for software. Um, and there's a couple of things that I really, really care about here is that at Pluralsight, um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about more what we do, but we're the world's largest developer IT and creative training library in the world. And the mission of the company is to create progress through technology that lifts the human condition. And so we have 25 cross-functional co-located product development teams, all with product management, user experience design, engineering, data science, content. This is the collection of these human beings. And we're human-centered. And in the last three years, we've done over 7,000 qualitative interviews. Just a massive set of interviews to truly understand, like Patrick before was talking about, you know, features. Like, I don't believe in features. I believe in experiences. I believe in unified user experiences that are contiguous, that when somebody drops into your product, they have this very holistic feeling. And when I got to Pluralsight, this was basically a library. We have 6,000 courses, and we called it a bookshelf. And you know, it was, it was great. You could command F and then look for a course, and you could find what you were looking for. Uh, we just thought we could do something a little bit different. And what we thought about was, not only do we want a native web application, but we'd like Roku, Chromecast, Apple TV. We want to understand learning styles through data science and engineering. We really wanted to go deep on how people would experience learning. And I don't know, you know, for all of you that are running your product, my hope is, is that as we go through this journey today, you know, I want you to think, I want you to kind of put yourself in, in my chair and think about your product from this chair uh, just to try the shirt on. Like, it might be uncomfortable, but I just want you to try the shirt on and see. So like I said, this is like really how I think about product development. Now today, we are literally going to just talk about outputs versus outcomes. It's one small section. However, I think that this section specifically is one of the, if not the most important, because it's like the journey that we're in the middle of in product management today. We've come from waterfall product development, then we moved to agile, then we're like scrum fall, scrum bond. We're like, we really don't know where we are. And I really just want to give you my perspective on it. Does that sound fair? It's great. So historically, um, you know, we've been really focused on outputs. And like, what, is, what does that mean? Well, you know, we've been committed to like shipping a thing at the end of the quarter. And at the end of the quarter, it kind of gets a Viking send off and then we hope and pray that this experience is going to engage, surprise and delight our customers. But we're really not measuring it. We really don't know if what we're shipping is really having the impact that we want on the business. And when I talk about impact, my context that I'd like you to know is it really comes from three core KPIs or metrics, headlights, taillights, and happiness. So headlights for me is usage, like how somebody uses our product. 
Um, tail lights as billings, but it really is the intention of an outcome that I'm going to share. And the last piece Patrick talked about uh, is NPS, Net Promoter Score, so happiness. When I got to Pluralsight, our NPS score was 42. Um, we have a whole series of personas. Our aggregate NPS today is around 70, uh, and we climbed that over the course of three years. The other frame of reference that I'd like you to know is like, you know, we're, you know, authoring the pages. And I don't know if you really understand this or not, but like data science, data engineering, augmented reality, all of these things that are really occurring right now, I, I liken it to the industrial revolution. Like, it, you know, somebody walked into a cotton field, picked up a piece of cotton, and like, it's weird, but like, we're wearing clothes today. And so you look at the cotton gin, the cotton ginny, the sewing machine, you know, all of those things collectively came together and like built, you know, the textile industry. It built cities. It built all these amazing things that we have. And I, I could show you this really cool, you know, MIT here. There was a graduating class that invented this basically nano technology bot that got infused into fabric today. Like this is within the last year. You guys can look it up. And it causes the fabric to actually breathe like the human skin. And I love this because this is the collection of like textiles with technology and three-dimensional printing and biotech all coming together in one ecosystem. And guys, like we're authoring the pages of this. Like we're, we're finding out like what we're ultimately going to become. And it might be 10 or 20 years from now, but we'll, uh, we'll get there. Cool. So, you know, like I said, you know, this is Nate Walkingshaw's take on outcomes. And I really want to dissect this. And the, you know, if at any point in time you feel like this isn't helpful, you know, you can leave. I don't want you guys to suffer through the, the presentation. That doesn't add value to you. So, you know, this is creating the whole product story. The origin of this uh, was really inspired by a lawnmower. Uh, and I know that might be weird, but I run every single morning. And when I go on this perpetual run, I have been thinking about the problem around outputs versus outcomes. And how do we get the whole entire industry around building software products around an idea that isn't committed to continually shipping just outputs? Like, they really dig deep around what an outcome for their company looks like. And so this is really the story of a lawnmower. So this is going to be fun. I'm excited to, uh, to have this conversation with you guys. And like, look, if you guys, like, you can raise your hand and you can ask a question. I'm, I don't, like, I don't want you just to spray and pray out here. Like, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Okay, so, you know, what do I usually do? I usually sit down in a room and I ask someone to draw a lawnmower. And, um, you know, the, Mike Baird, the guy that helped me design a lot of this presentation, he actually illustrated this lawnmower. And then when I ask him to draw a lawnmower, I'm like, hey, would you mind telling me, like, the most important parts of a lawnmower, could you give me the morphology of it? Could you design it for me? And inherently, like, this is some of the things that happen. And I'll let this build out. So would you guys say that this is probably some of the things or some of the elements that you guys would pull out around a lot more as the most important? Yeah, okay, cool. So the next thing I say is like, would you mind placing the word team? And like, man, I, like, this concept is like so cool when it comes to fruition. When, and I, and I have no idea how Honda does this. Like, this is all just a story for context for that I made up. But like, if I was Honda, uh, I can imagine that they have a propulsion team, that they have an engine team, that they've got a handle team. Like, they've got a whole bunch of cross-functional, co-located, autonomous teams working on a product called a lawnmower, right? And they've got to, like, ship a lawnmower. And so when I talk about building teams around a product and around a lawnmower, like, they've got to look a certain way. And Patrick alluded to this about companies building software that don't talk to their customers. Like, to me, this is, like, the core. Like you have to have a product manager, a user experience designer, an engineer, and then whatever your core competency is working on that experience. And I've talked a lot about this over the last three years, um, and there's a lot of uh, information on the internet about it that I've written on that I would just ask you to go take a look at. Like how do you build a product experience team? 
And like our core competency like is data science and engineering and content, like content is a huge piece of our core competency. So whatever your company's core competency is, this is the foundational team and then you supplement it with whatever your core is. And they, you know, my preference is, is for them to be co-located and they can all see the sausage being made at the same time. So I won't spend a bunch of time there, but I do want to go back to this. <clears throat> so when, you know, Honda gets together and they go design their lawnmower, not only ho let's hope that they've organized the teams correctly, let's hope that they're cross-functional and co-located, and then the thing that I've drawn in the inside of here is the intention. This is an outcome, okay? And the outcome is very different from the use of how a product is used. The outcome looks like 12,000 uh, 12, hours, 6,000 mows, 0.38 acres, right? I mean, this is what the lawnmower needs to do over the course of a life. And trust me, I'll tie this all back to software. But are you starting to see this in your mind, how this is happening? Yeah, great. So let's take a look at the use of a lawnmower. So I think that this would represent probably 80% of the customer you know, demographic that would use a lawnmower. And when you're looking at the use compared to the outcome, do you realize that as the person is using your product, right, you have this happiness over time curve. And you know, the hope is, is that it will you know, it'll make it through 20 or 25 years of somebody doing this every single week to mow their lawn. And if you really break apart you know, the user story and the life of the mower, what ends up happening here is you begin to see something pretty clear. And like when I've ran massive product teams, like we have a big product team at Pluralsight, what occurs is that we have these teams that get in each other's way constantly. There's constant infighting on who owns the narrative, who owns the story, who works on what. And just to really be clear, all of these teams share the narrative, but they work cross-functionally together. And in software products, this happens to be a huge problem because they all think that they own the narrative in its entirety. The thing that's really cool about this, and we'll get into versioning, but you know, I have the outcome of the mower that I ended up shipping. There's also a service provider, somebody that actually maintains the product, right? And when I come back to the service provider, these teams have been working on the iterations, the versions of the lawnmower, and I could extend the life of that mower over time. And this is really the impetus. Like, everyone's working on the narrative, everyone's working on the user story, but it's going to affect the outcome of what we work on over time. And so I love talking about, you know, how do you solve massive product problems at scale? Like, if you were at Honda and you had to go, you know, build a lawnmower for 100 million different people across the world in 150 different countries, like, that's a daunting task, and we're kind of up against the same thing, right, when we're building our, our, so our software products. So this is a, a, you know, a case that I really care about around corner cases. And most of the time, every complex product problem that I've solved over the last 20 years really comes focusing on the extreme. So you know, when I go talk to customers around a lawnmower, I'm not going to talk to someone in Utah that lives on the Upper East Side bench that mows he or she's lawn every single week. What I would like to do is talk to the person that uses a mower 40 times per day. Because what happens when I do that, it usually covers 80% of your core market. More importantly is you also get the outliers, which end up being one-step adjacencies. And this could be like a trimmer. Like I wouldn't want a mower to do a trimmer's job. I wouldn't want a mower to do a blower's, a blower's job, right? Like the mower needs to do the mower's job. And this is really useful and really helpful in software. I also like to show an as-lived example. And this really was the whole purpose of wanting to, to give this talk. This is this run that I go on every single morning. And this person is Colby. And like Colby's missing something. And he's missing a bag. And uh, you're, you're gonna see what happened here. This is Dante. Now like Dante is like, she's the happiest person. She is so cool. Um, and this is Sandy Parks and Rex in Salt Lake City, Utah. And their job every single day is to mow, you know, 40 or 50 lawns. This is an eight acre park, it's massive. 
And when I was running around this park, this is the same run I do pretty much, it's like Groundhog's Day every single morning. Um, I end up running, you know, through this. And it's like super frustrating. I'm like, dude, like, why don't you have your bag on, Colby? Like, it's ridiculous. You know, and Dante, yeah, and if you were to go back to Dante, there's a little green bag sitting on the ground. Like, just think about the thought that she's taken into this. Not only is she going to mow it, but she's already got the bag to bag the grass. So no blades of grass, like, get anywhere on the concrete. It's, it's cool, like, the way that she's thinking about it. But Colby, you know, he's a mess. And I was like, what in the hell is the deal with that? So I want you just to avoid the amount of sweat dripping off my forehead, because there's going to be a lot of it. And I just want you to listen to what Dante says, because it's really cool. All right, Dante, tell me why, was it Colby? Yeah. Tell me why Colby doesn't put the bag on there. Because he's mowing the squares, and so when he puts his bagger on, it will hit the bottom and scrape the bottom, so then the grass is going to come out anyways. Yeah, so cool. So he blows his instead of bags it. It's awesome. Thanks, man. You're welcome. <laughs> cool. So do you guys understand what happened there? Do you understand what's going on? Just answer. Someone. Yes? Do you? Yeah, bottom of the bag is doing what? Yeah, that's right. Okay, like, look, guys, holy smokes. Let me just, this is the park strip that we're talking about, okay? Like, hopefully you're going to see what's happened here, okay? And, like, Kobe, Kobe's hitting park strips all day. And, like, when Kobe hits park strips, it creates this massive mess of grass everywhere. So think about this. Like, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. The elevation changes, like, from 2,000 to 5,500 uh, feet, and it, we call it the bench, so like everything that occurs in Utah has an incline on it. And so you're trying to tell me that this mower, like every single time I hit the park strip that has an incline, rips the bag off and dumps grass every single. Now like I won't tell you what the math is, but you could assume that Colby makes between 10 and 15 bucks an hour. And you could look at Sandy City Parks and Rec and the cost of that single lawnmower and the time and the money that's being spent on a design flaw by not talking to customers, by not talking to the corner case of what's occurring for probably hundreds of millions of mowers that exist in the marketplace for years. That's crazy. So like, the outcome, like if I look at the happiness over time metric, like Kobe and this team's really impacted. Think about all of the individuals that live on the bench around the world or on any type of park strip that has an incline. This is, you know, this has a massive impact. So, I always want to go back to personas, to these people that we design for, the, the customers we should be talking to. You've got manufacturer, that's Honda. I've got a corner case that uses a bag. I've got corner cases that don't use a bag. That's an extreme use case. And then I've got this service provider. And the way that I want to measure the impact or the outcome of this is really, you know, happiness over time. And so I wanted to plot out a graph around how this occurs for me. So on this far right one, this, this isn't me. This, uh, this is more like my father-in-law. My father-in-law is like amazing. He's had his mower for like 30 years. And he services it, he takes it in for random service, he you know, winterizes it and does all that stuff. This also isn't me. Um, this is really me. Like I, I like use a lawnmower <laughs> and then I never service it. Uh, and then I replace it like every five to seven years and Honda loves me as a customer. Um, I, I wish, and you could look at like total wallet share for services over time, hopefully your mind's going there. Um, you know, you could look at replacement cost of mowers, like all of these different people that are thinking about uh, using this mower at scale. The other thing you can count on with users is like, you know, peeps, you know, they be doing weird, weird things with lawn mowers. You know, this is one thing that you can count on. And I just want to say, like, when you're designing a product uh, for scale, we tend to listen to these types of customers, like when you do customer interviews. You listen to the loud majority that tell you that there's a problem with your product, and when actuality, they're not even using it through your intention, through your outcome, through the 12,000 hours, 6,000 mows, 0.38 acres. They're not following the simple narrative that the cross-functional co-located team is on. 
they're using it like this. It's weird. Like, like I wouldn't want to build a team around that use case or that narrative or that user story. You could imagine uh, what it potentially could look like. And that brings me back to versioning and how you think about versioning your product and versioning the, the lawnmower scale. So I'll go back to that simple narrative. You know, when these teams are working, you know, cross-functionally on this narrative, each one of those teams is going to pull just a sentence out in it, and this is the thing that they're going to perpetually innovate over time. So again, I always want to come back to Honda, and this is just a regular push mower. But if you think the entire line of Honda mowers that exist, and there's a train team focused on wheels, they own the version of every single one of those wheels. Just like our product teams today, like we have something called learning paths or skill paths. They own skill paths in perpetuity forever and the version control of that. They also own an outcome in our product called the time to learn or the time it takes someone to effectively apply their knowledge. And so, you know, when you're thinking about versioning, they thought about, you know, this was the gas cap that they designed and this is an ungloved hand. Well, then they also think about what a gloved hand or maybe a new, you know, round gas cap could look like and how that affects, you know, retention and happiness over time. You're constantly thinking about that because look, it can go either way. You could launch something into a mower that they come in for a service interval or some, launch something into your product and happiness and retention goes down. So you want to constantly put metrics into your product that's monitoring retention to find out what the likelihood to buy, what the length of stay, what the usage, all of these key components that we care about driving usage, billings, and happiness when we're versioning these experiences really matters. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see a lot of nods. Great, you're awesome. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to go all the way back to you know, something that we, def, you know, we care about a ton, which is tying this back to software. So like I said, uh, you know, we work for, I work for Pluralsight. This is the browse page uh, inside of our software platform. And I would just ask, you know, what is your intention? So I know our intention when, within our product, and this could be akin to the same outcome that I've given you for the lawnmower. And the intention of our product or the outcome of our product is this time to effectively apply learning. Like we're a learning company, so we better care about when a human being comes into it, they actually get taught something and then apply it in their life. And like for us to come up with the outcome, it took us three years to learn that the time to learn and the time to effectively apply that knowledge is the key metric that we needed to care about around our outcome took us a long time. So I would ask you, you know, do you know what your intention is for your software product? Like, do you know what the outcome you would like to have for this person at the end of your narrative, at the end of your use case, at the end of your story? And so, and again, this doesn't directly apply to, to Pluralsight. It should apply to the way that you build products every single day. And, you know, we looked at the corner case, and the corner case for Pluralsight looked like somebody that had to learn in a very short window of time, like their career depended on it. They were trying to move up in a role or they maybe had just come out of college and they were getting their job for their very first time and they were trying to move from novice to expert. And we're in 150 different countries, three and a half million accounts, and so we were able to look at that section of hyper users. And trust me, it solved the problem for nearly everyone in our product at scale. And I'm gonna show you how it worked. So this was, you know, our corner case persona. You know, there's lots of goals and objectives that each individual, that this specific learner, and it really just solved the problem for persona B. Takes a minute for this to build. I've got persona C. It looks a lot prettier on these monitors, guys, I promise. We cared a lot about the, the fidelity here. And then we've got all of these different goals. Now look, I've got three different personas, and depending on the size of the company you're calling on, it's going to yo-yo. This one person, right, if it's a small and emerging in a commercial company, all three of these people could be one person. Or if you're a big enterprise company, these three people could be totally separate human beings. But the things that they're going to do within your product experience are going to be very similar. And it's a shared outcome. At the very back of this is how your product's going to stitch an experience together to create an outcome over here called time to learn. All right, so I want to wrap it up. 
Yeah, I think the, the biggest piece for me is, you know, when you get together with your product organization, you know, leading with an intention and leading with an outcome is probably one of the best things that you could possibly do. At the beginning of the talk, I don't know how you're organized, but how you're organized matters so much. If these teams aren't human-centered, if they don't have product management, UX, and engineering, building the simple narrative, building the product all holistically together, and then talking to the customer before they ever build a thing, I think you're, you're really gonna struggle to have product market fit. The other thing is, is that when you don't build the right thing, when you don't ship the right version, and the engineering team gets to see customer relation or customer dissatisfaction, man, does it massively motivate the population of engineers to go solve that problem over time. The other thing is like they want to write the user story or the narrative with you. Um, the shared outcomes and shared narratives, I think that's just systemic within our products uh, and a problem that we're working to solve. Uh, I think data science and data engineering is really going to help us. And measuring happiness and retention and versioning your products over time is really, really key. So the, thing, the last thing I'd uh, wrap up with is just I've written a ton of this. You guys are getting a very small subset of the overall narrative and story. Um, there's a book that I wrote called Product Leadership, and there's a ton of content and medium types out there. Uh, and the one thing I would like to do is just give Patrick and Price Intelligently a plug. Um, you know, we've used these guys for the last three years, and when I got to Pluralsight the first time, our pricing was a mess. It was an absolute mess. We really were a B2C business, and we built an enterprise, you know, B2B platform over the last three years. We just didn't have an enterprise-worthy product. We were mostly small and emerging and mid-market. And Patrick and this team really helped us partner. And the way that I thought about them was really from, a, from the financial perspective was they're kind of like my audit committee. There's, they're my third party, neutral away from my confirmation bias on what people should really experience. And they offered a perspective and a view from an analytical perspective that we really couldn't bring to the table. And so, like, look, if you guys aren't using, you know, Price Intelligently, I'd, I'll encourage you guys. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks. Got some time for some Q&A. I know we have some mics in the... Mics out. Q Who's got a question? Okay. Anyone? Over here on the yeah. left. Over here. Uh, hey, Nate. Uh, great yeah. talk. Um, Thanks, bro. You had a question, or you were talking about um, having a metric that everyone can kind of look to. And you were talking about reducing... Uh, time to applied learning, right, or application of learning. Yeah. That's a really lagging metric to me. Like yeah. something like plural study, if you're like learning Angular and applying Angular, how do you, one, not like annoyingly survey the crap out of everyone to find yeah. out, hey, did you apply Angular and da 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 da? And then on the flip side, mm -hmm. how do you empower a team to give them more leading metrics and like how many leading metrics do you have to use that you can kind of react to? Yeah, dude, it's an awesome question. So, uh, like I said, the, the time to learn and the time to effectively apply learning, that metric that we came up with, I mean, it really took us the compilation of three years. So, the thing I would say most importantly here, uh, and I kind of, I would ask first, like, do you even actually have a lawnmower, right? That was really the impetus. Like, at Pluralsight three years ago, we didn't even have a lawnmower to drive people to those metrics. Uh, and so this was, you know, through eight acquisitions that built a holistic experience that we could actually say we've got something that could really change learning for the world. So that was the first thing is like asking ourselves, do we even have a product that actually does the job that we intended it to do? The second thing was us understanding uh, the behavior of those learners. And I think, you know, I would just give huge, a huge shout out to the data science and engineering world for us. You know, we, we didn't have a metric other than the early metrics that I think the rest of the world is using, which is really headlights, taillights, and billings. And that was our North Star, man. We, we didn't have anything then other than usage, which, like, the way that usage worked was average logins per learner. So did we actually go from, like, three logins to 12 logins? That's how rudimentary the metric was. Right? Did when they were inside of our product, did they go from you know three minutes of viewing videos to 12 or 60 or however many minutes? So we used that as a metric early, like early as our beacon of hope. We really didn't start understanding behavior, human behavior, 
on like learning styles. And what I mean by that is like, if I look at all of you, you know, from my perspective as a CXO at Pluralsight, like all of you guys learn differently. So I know that I've got a bits and jits learner. I know that I've got a just in time learner. I know that I've got a high focus and low focus learner. I know that some people will like look on their phones and just listen to me. Well, our product had to figure that out, like figure out who those people were, how they learn, and how they close that learning. That wasn't done through qualitative research. That was done through machine learning. It was all correlation and causation for us. So, you know, to answer your question, it's pretty complex and super deep. Um, it's something that we're in the middle of I, on, like, on a daily basis um, with our data science and data engineering team to try and understand the, the learning modality, you know, the learning type, the learning style, and then provide it in a really meaningful way. And the way that we've solved that problem in the past is by those three, what I feel like are kind of empty metrics, and now we're really putting some teeth and some rigor to it. Does that help answer the question? Cool, man, That's thanks. Great. It's a great question. Yeah, it's great. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just curious, you've got your, uh, in terms of your organization, each team has its own experience designer on the team. Yeah. How do you have a cohesive experience across all the teams? How do you organize for that? Yeah, it's a great question. So for those of you guys, he's asking how you know, we organize all of our cross-functional co-located teams on one experience and then also create continuity across that experience. Is that true? So the story, it, 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 all the pages of your experience can yeah. come into the same book, it's the same font, same style. Yeah. Yeah, so that's great. We, um, Dimitri actually owns the, like the UI design. So like the font, the, everything that you would see in the UI kit for our entire experience is owned actually by a UI team. Okay, okay so this will be helpful on the architecture and I don't wanna go super meta here, but most of you will understand, like when I got to Pluralsight, it was a monolithic web application and we had two stacks of technology, .NET and Angular, that's it. So what happened is like when you acquire eight companies, right, half of those were content, half of those were products. And whether or not you're building products. And this is like a big deal. Like what I'm going to say right now is like a huge deal. What I feel like we face with as technology leaders every day is the problem that we have to solve, which is hiring is a big problem. Skills, the skills gap is a big problem. And it ties directly back to the product I'm able to build. So what we ended up deciding from a product architecture perspective is we went from a monolithic web application to polyglot, so multiple languages, because we acquired these companies. And we went to you know, what people call domain-driven design or bounded context. You could call them microservices, but it's really not that. They own their entire stack of technology. So continuous discovery and continuous delivery. They own the entire experience. And that has DevOps, security SecOps, data science engineering, content, product management, user experience design, and engineering, and they own that experience. So when I said, hey, we have skill paths, or we have our course page, or our browse page, just like this narrative, those are product lines, all coming into one unified UI, right, uh, of that experience over time. And it, it really is true, like I can't tell you this enough, like our, the customers that we have, whether we believe it or not, share the same experience in most of the cases that you and I could talk through today. Like a CTO could be an author that could be a skills development leader that could be a learner. All of those people show up in our product the same way uh, based off of years of experience. It's, it's a really fascinating exercise when you really dig under the hood. But it's a shared UI. We call it UI nav. And basically what I showed you on that browse page, that left hand side, UI navigation is shared across the entire uh, experience. It's a great question, man. Wow. Yeah, one more? Yeah. There's a mic right behind you. Hey, Nate, I'm Todd. Thanks a lot. Your, your last uh, answer was a good segue into this question <laughs> about the happiness curves. Yeah. So in your example, the happiness curves go down over time, right? But what, what we've experienced is, so Dimitri decides the UI, the UX is a little jacked up, needs to make a bunch of changes, introduces it, Happiness goes way down yep. initially because it may be objectively better, but oh, dude. it's new, it's different. It's good stuff. And then over time, it actually goes up. So how should we think about the happiness curves in that environment? Yeah, dude, I love what you're saying. So look, when I got to Pluralsight, uh, I, I should have showed the, t like, the team, like you guys, my team out here. I should have showed you guys this. The first page that we got to Pluralsight on, and I would just recommend you do this. It's called a hotspots drill. 
The hotspots drill is look, you know, if you have Google Analytics, just look at where all of the human beings coalesce inside your product. So at Plural Site, I'll just tell you, like it was on two pages. For you know, for buyers or you know, CTOs, it was on the analytics page, of course, because they wanted to find out what people were doing. The second page for us was our course page. So 93% of traffic inside of our core web application existed on that page. And dude, we had to do something called reinvent the course page. Yeah, it was a real barn burner. Because we had light UI, okay, and we went to a dark UI navigation. And what I would tell you is that your users don't know the entire narrative that you're trying to ship. Like you're shipping a very small part of the ultimate rewrite that you're going to show. And you need to ride the storm. Like it's going to go down. Uh, and so I would say net promoter score was 41. When we relaunched the course page, our NPS dropped by 37 points. Okay, and we rode the trough out for probably 90 days until we launched browse and faceted search. So that was the complete, it was basically discoverability of products in our, in our core experience. We knew we only had the capacity, a small engineering team, we're only eight individuals when I got there. You know, we're 400 people now. Uh, but we were only eight developers, no product management, no UX design, and we just replaced the single page. And we, we paid the price, man. I mean, it was brutal. And then after about 90 days, we launched the new experiences, and then NPS jumped almost to 60. Uh, it was massive. Then likelihood to buy and length of stay like went up. Average login per learner went from 3 to 12. Average session time went from 3 minutes to 11 to 60 minutes. It was a massive change for the whole product. And so then we knew. We knew we had something that was really going to stick uh, with the customer base. It's a great question, man. Wow. Yeah. That was awesome, man. Cool. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, it. thanks. One yeah. more for Nate. Yeah, thanks, thanks man. Man. That was yeah. Cool.